Good morning, everyone. My name is Miguel Leon, and I'm a program officer with the Michelson 20MM Foundation. Thank you all so much for joining us for part two of our Connecting California webinar series. Before we get started, and as we give folks a few minutes to hop on Zoom, I want to share a bit of background on our foundation and describe what we have in store for you today. Founded by Dr. Gary K. Michelson and Alia Michelson, the Michelson 20MM Foundation is dedicated to ensuring that equitable post-secondary educational opportunities that lead to meaningful careers are accessible to all. We operate at the cutting edge of higher education to help forward-thinking entrepreneurs, nonprofits, and startups close the opportunity gap. Connecting California aims to increase awareness across our philanthropic community of the impacts of digital inequity, as well as explore case studies of proven models and solutions implemented in state and around the country. Our convenings also intend to provide a forum for philanthropic leaders to explore and redefine their role and relationship to the digital divide with an eye to both near-term needs made more urgent by COVID-19, as well as necessary long-term solutions that can sustainably help close the digital divide. Through Connecting California, we hope to cohere a strong coalition that is committed to solving digital inequity in California once and for all. Our convening today, Stronger Together, the role of cross-sector partnerships in digital equity, will focus on de deepening our understanding of how effective public-private partnerships can be designed and implemented to excellence, specifically at the local and regional levels. Today, you will hear from subject matter experts from government and digital equity practitioners who will share case studies of proven models and solutions implemented both in state and around the country. Quick note, the opinions expressed in this webinar are each participant's perspective on how to best tackle the digital divide. They in no way represent the opinions or views of the Michelson 20MM Foundation, its partners, or the office of the governor of the state of California. Before we get started, I wanna remind everyone that you will be able to ask questions via the Zoom chat function. We'll be dedicating the last portion of our webinar to answering some, if not all, of your queries. And with all that said, it's my pleasure to now introduce Phil Kim, president of the Michelson 20MM Foundation, who will share welcoming remarks. Phil. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I wanna just jump right in and um, introduce uh, our panelists and just provide a, a little bit of background. We have with us um, Jeannie Bennett, Jenny Bennett, Chief Financial Officer for the City of Chicago. Um, Jenny has a wide range of both public sector and private sector experience with particular expertise in managing, managing financial turnarounds and large complex capital structures, developing governmental budgets and finding paths towards uh, financial stability. We also have Joshua Edmonds, Director of Digital Inclusion for the City of Detroit. Josh is responsible for developing the city's sustainable digital inclusion strategy. And he comes into the role with experience as a fellow at the Cleveland Foundation, where he leveraged philanthropic and corporate funding to help address Cleveland's digital divide. And has also worked at President Obama's Connect Home Initiative at the Cuyahoga Metropolitan Housing Authority. Uh, Seth Hubbard, Executive Director for Tech Exchange. Tech Exchange is a Bay Area nonprofit that provides equitable technology access to underserved communities through refurbishing donated computers and providing digital skills training. In his six years, Seth has grown the organization 500% and served 20, 25,000 families with home access support. Uh, before joining Tech Exchange, Seth served as an educator for 10 years and also served on the Technology Innovation and Design Committee for the European Council of uh, International Schools. Uh, we also have with us Jordan Sun, Chief Innovation Officer for the City of San Jose. Jordan brings deep cross-sector global experience in innovation, technology, government, and healthcare to work on behalf of the residents of San Jose. Uh, Keto's work is his experience as the Chief Operating Officer for the Special Operations Joint Task Force Afghanistan Technology Team with the U.S. Army while deployed in Kabul. Um, and moderating everything for us today is Gene Holm, uh, Chief Data Officer and Senior Technology Advisor to LA Mayor Eric Garcetti. Um, in her role, Jean helps 4 million people and 500,000 businesses get access to and use data for innovation, equity, health, and safety every day. Um, prior to joining the Garcetti administration, Jean was the 
uh, self-proclaimed evangelist for uh, open data for the White House under President Obama, uh, the leader for Africa Open Data for the World Bank, and the chief knowledge architect at NASA. Uh, we are excited and grateful to have all of our panelists with us, and we're, we're confident that you'll um, find today's conversation both enjoyable and fruitful. Uh, before we do get started, I do want to just make a couple of quick acknowledgements. Um, Connecting California is presented by the Michelson 20MM Foundation in service of advancing digital equity for all of California's students and families. Uh, we want to extend a special thank you to our foundation partners, the California Community Foundation, the Angel Foundation, and Southern California Grantmakers. Um, we're also fortunate enough to have our founder with us this, this morning, um, Dr. Gary Michelson. Dr. Gary Michelson and his wife, Alia, have committed the vast majority of their resources towards um, charitable endeavors as catalytic philanthropists um, and has dedicated most of his life to being a, a voice for the, the voiceless. So with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Michelson to make a few remarks to kind of get us started here. Good morning, and thank you all so much for joining us today. First, I'd like to recognize the work of the passionate Michelson 20 Million Mind Digital Equity Team. Phil Kim, Hannah, Emily, Rachel, Myra, and especially Miguel for making today possible. Now, a half a year into this pandemic, here in our own backyard of Los Angeles, 50,000 students are still without devices or hotspots. Across the state, 450,000 families are still unable to participate fully in remote education. During this crisis, progress has been made with the very real help of the internet service providers, also in obtaining and deploying appropriate devices, and even with some training outreach. But the need is now more urgent and the long-term implications for the most vulnerable students more serious than ever. The pre-COVID digital divide has now shown itself for what it really is, an education gap and an opportunity gap. There is an old saying that the best time to plant a shade tree was actually 50 years ago. So yes, we can look around and be disappointed with what has not yet been done. But as some of today's panelists will prove, the very next best time is right now. Today's session is intended to provide a space in which to foster collaboration between California's public, private, nonprofit, and philanthropic sectors to find and drive forward digital equity solutions. Digital equity leaders from Los Angeles, San Jose, Chicago, and Detroit will present their respective models and share with us what has worked for them. As you will hear from nearly all of today's speakers, philanthropy does have a part to play. To me, when best played, philanthropy is catalytic in inducing government with its considerable assets to step up and to recognize and to meet the needs of we the people. Just recently, my own foundation offered the state of California a quarter of a million dollars to underwrite an RFI. What is that? A request for innovation prize to excite this country's inventors and innovators to create new cutting edge technologies to meet the daunting challenge of broadband for everyone. Perhaps something that would be to fiber optic cable, just what fiber optic cable was to copper wire. Apart from the efforts of our government and the Department of Education, Assembly Member Cecilia agar Kari and Senator Lena Gonzalez have been the driving forces between two important digital divide bills, which they carried in this last legislative session. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce Senator Alina Gonzalez, who has been a longtime champion of digital equity. She authored SB 1130, which among other things, aimed to approve funding for infrastructure projects that would have provided high capacity, future looking infrastructure to no less than 98% of California households. Please welcome Senator Gonzalez. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Michelson, and thank you to the 20MM Foundation and all of its members and supporters, as well as your wife, and so many people who are doing the great work to ensure that we close the digital divide even before COVID hit. 
Um, I want to thank, uh, again, everyone who has been engaged on this process, and we know that we have a lot more collaboration to do. And to Dr. Michelson's point, every single person, every entity has a role in this, whether you're philanthropy, whether you are city, uh, county, state, and even private um, entities and corporations all have a role to play. Coming from a, a large tech corporation before I got to the state Senate, we knew that digital inclusion was so very important. We know that over 1.2 million Californians have a lack of access or under, uh, are, are underserved completely. Whether you're in a rural community or an urban community, we know this is, this is an important uh, issue for every single person. 70% of suburban households have the internet that leaves 30% of us out. 60% of rural communities have internet, but that leaves 40% of them out. And I think that private uh, industry, philanthropy, and nonprofits all have a role to play in this. As uh, Dr. Michelson mentioned, I was an author of SB 1130. It was a bill that we had put forward even before the COVID crisis hit. We knew that this was an important issue. 1130 allowed for more competition in the market to, to allow local governments to then uh, apply for the California Services Fund, and all, also smaller internet service providers. And it also um, uh, ensure that we were upgrading technology speeds to ensure that if you do have investment in infrastructure for broadband that you're not getting slow seat speeds that you're absolutely being invested in with a mindful approach for very high speeds so people can get back uh, to work and they can telehealth and they can also distance learn in this COVID environment. But again, I want to make sure that we continue to build coalitions and collaboration all up and down the state and that we are ensuring that investments in communities and cities are established with digital inclusion plans and that we focus on outcomes so that we do have uh, a really good plan that will work for all Californians up and down the state. Lastly, I invite you to join me in ensuring that we get this legislative uh, process started and anyone who would like to be a part of that, I, I certainly welcome you. And again, I wanna thank the foundation for all its work and I look forward to hearing more on this panel. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Gonzalez. Uh, uh, we'll turn it over now to Jean Holm, who will moderate our conversation today. Jean. Great, thank you so much, Miguel, and welcome everybody. Uh, really appreciate all of your interest in what's been going on around the digital divide and more positively around the opportunities to improve digital inclusion across our amazing state. Um, we really stand in a once-in-a-generation opportunity right now with the focus on the inequities that have manifested around digital uh, inclusion, the opportunity around the expansion of the 5G network with telecommunications company actually also provides an opportunity. And again, really the idea of making the internet a public utility, it's a basic human need. If we all think about how we conduct our business, especially during the pandemic, that need for internet access, for digital literacy, and for connectivity is just as essential as the need for fresh water. And so as we start to think towards that, um, you'll hear from our panelists today. They're going to start off with their uh, perspective on what's been happening in their city or with their organization. I'm just going to put a little context about what's been happening in Los Angeles. We've seen this issue uh, manifesting over the last several years, particularly as we look at the opportunity to govern what we have left ungoverned in the past. And we're not unique. This has happened in regional governments, state governments, city governments, national governments, all over the world. Telecommunication companies have built out their networks appropriately in neighborhoods where there's been a need, but that need is often driven by the ability for that community to pay and the individuals in that community to pay for that internet capability. And as governments, we provide access to our assets, whether those are streetlights or real estate or parks, so that the telecommunication companies can do that. But, but what that's led us to is the really a digital redlining, the inability of certain communities to gain ready, affordable access to the internet, in ways that are understandable to them. And so I always think being a Californian, a third generation Californian, <laughs> I always think of our need around digital connectivity in three ways. And I, I use CAL as our acronym. So connectivity, we wanna make sure people have the ability to connect. Accessibility, we wanna make sure that people have some device that they're literate with to be able to connect. 
And then thirdly, literacy, that they have the digital literacy to get online safely, to transact online, to make payments online, and to be able to do this in a way that is really helpful and safe for them. We've worked um, internally to improve our processes in support of telecommunications businesses because the faster they build their networks in areas of digital divide, the better it is for all of our residents and businesses. We've been able to improve our ability to permit and get installations in place by 3,000% in the last two years. So that's a huge uh, kudos to our public works department. And we've also built up and started a new, um, this year, a new telecommunications and digital equity council that includes all of our infrastructure and telecommunications companies. And this has been a really great way to get the, both their needs met, but also a focus on digital equity. And we've had some amazing contributions from those companies from deploying uh, free Wi-Fi in our public, um, in some of our public housing areas, to being able to uh, upskill and provide free services for our LA Unified School, our 753,000 LA Unified School District uh, kids. Um, all of that leads us to the uh, opportunities that we're looking towards to the future. But what I'll do is I'll queue it up to each of our speakers to uh, to talk about what's happening in their city. So Josh, why don't we start with you? Thank you, uh, everybody, um, for, for, the, for this opportunity. And in the city of Detroit, uh, we are experiencing significant momentum uh, around what we are referring to as Connect 313. Uh, as the city's first director of digital inclusion, one of the uh, things that I've just been really focusing on is how do we collect all of this, uh, capture all this momentum and energy, uh, and obviously realizing the uh, time that we're in um, to uh, catapult ourselves into a, a larger discussion around technology and opportunity. And so when we're focusing on Connect 313, oftentimes we refer to that as an operation. And I want to be very intentional with the wording and the framing that I'm using here, because this is not just a group of um, what we're seeing in other cities, um, a group of nonprofits and community folks coming together and some internet providers in a uh, looser fashion. We're saying, how do we create a brand and an identity based on partnerships that can empower philanthropic um, partners who are sitting at our table that as they're going to their leadership, they're able to um, ask for uh, more capital, more resources flowing into this space. But in addition, as we're having uh, even our internet providers on the ground who are not headquartered in Detroit, but have a presence such as Comcast and AT&T, how do we empower those local folks to be able to then go to their leadership and bring more resources into Detroit and at the same time, any of our uh, public officials who are wanting to lean in, how do we protect their interests in a way where we are community driven um, and we have a big emphasis on our values. And so some of the things that we've been able to accomplish this year alone um, is really uh, phenomenal and a testament to the uh, community that we have broadly speaking here. But we were able to raise $23 million of private capital um, to actually address the homework gap uh, specifically on behalf of all of our public school students. So that was a, a way for us to be able to deploy 51,000 uh, uh, devices with a year's worth of tech support, as well as six months of internet access with the promise to um, transition those households to uh, high-speed broadband internet. Um, and that, that was just one thing, which then became a domino for us to then say, well, what else can we be doing in this space? And that's when we had created our uh, Connect 313 fund. And that fund um, was um, uh, done in, in, in great generosity from the Rock Family Companies and the Rocket Mortgage Classic, a golf tournament that uh, had actually was able to, 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 to lean in and give us about $2 million worth of seed capital to start our Connect the Room Through Fund with a focus on establishing a data trust. Uh, that data trust, the, the, the goal of that is to have the most, the most robust and complete data set on digital inclusion. So that way, if you are anyone who's doing work in Detroit, you are going to be empowered with the data that you need to do any type of analysis or receive any type of funding or just to be in the know uh, instead of using um, antiquated American community survey data. Uh, in addition, we have uh, also from that fund been able to focus on establishing a neighborhood technology hub network as well as um, uh, looking specifically at arming our community ambassadors and getting better community storytelling and media activation. Uh, everything that I'm saying here, I'm, I'm trying to keep it pretty high level, but when we're looking at the media activation piece in particular, I think that many of us will agree that historically the digital divide conversation 
has been looked at in a very singular fashion and we do ourselves a disservice when we don't look at the digital divide as it relates to the entire ecosystem and how it's strangling opportunity and how it's uh, holding us back collectively as we look at our, our, our other populations in, in addition to obviously uh, our, our children. And so this has been a, um, it's been a great opportunity in Detroit for what we're building and really thankful uh, for the opportunity to be heard here and look forward to sharing much more insight on what we're doing in Detroit. Great, thanks so much, Josh. Uh, it's really um, inspiring to see the work that you've done. And uh, as I said, I was a big fan of your testimony to Congress about, uh, about all of this work and really kind of repping cities and counties for, for how we're trying to struggle through it. Um, and really the idea of building partnership, I think is so essential. And there's lots of roles for people to play here. Jenny, why don't we talk about what's going on with you? Great. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me here. I'm excited to talk about Chicago Connected, which is our program for increasing internet accessibility in the city of Chicago. It's a program that will serve approximately 100,000 students by the uh, time we sign up uh, the program fully. Um, it's a very large and long lasting program. And so as we think about how we constructed this program um, and how we uh, sought to meet the needs of our students and bridging the digital divide, um, it wasn't just about the overall size of the program, but also the long, uh, longer duration. Um, the, we are providing internet access for up to four years. And as the mayor often says, in the midst of our uh, COVID activities, we want to build permanent infrastructure and not just uh, interim scaffolding. And so as a part of that, we designed to not just address the immediate COVID needs, but really try to address the digital divide overall. In Chicago, based on our census data, as well as some of the data analytics that we've done in the midst of COVID, one in five students lack access to high-speed internet. When you look at underserved communities, that goes up to one in two or one in three. And so, um, you know, was really a critical part of um, our design in um, addressing uh, not just the interim needs, but uh, how we could bridge the digital divide more fully and permanently. Um, importantly, we also endeavored to meet families where they are. And so as a part of that, there are a number of elements of the program that are designed uh, to achieve that goal. Um, we are offering both wired service as well as hotspot services, which um, allows us to meet the different needs of our families. For example, for some of the uh, families who are housing insecure, a wired service is probably not as appropriate for their situations. Alternatively, for other families where you may have um, multi-generational families or other household members who also may need access to internet, a wired service um, allows us to help um, achieve some of the goals of bring bringing internet more broadly um, beyond CPS students. Uh, in addition to that, um, we've also created a component of the program, which includes 35 community-based organizations in order to help us with outreach. Um, one of the uh, important early lessons learned is that the outreach component really is critical in order to make sure we're reaching uh, families who historically have been difficult to reach. And so the community-based organizations have uh, been, helping, been helping us with uh, the sign-up and uh, really exponential sign-up that we've seen over the course of the last few weeks. And also, we implemented a 30-point marketing plan, um, which included both targeted and general marketing. Um, you really can't go anywhere in Chicago without seeing something related to Chicago Connected um, and was an important part of our outreach efforts to, to, to let people know that the service was available to them. Uh, as it relates to signups, we have 33,000 signups at this point and are targeting another uh, uh, two-thirds of that uh, goal, which would be uh, 40,000 signups by the end of October. Um, with the uh, goal of having the full 100,000 signups by the end of the year. Um, that over the last week has amounted to about 2,000 signups in one week, uh, which amounts to roundly about uh, sign up every two minutes. Um, I wouldn't, uh, I would be remiss um, if I didn't end my comments with a comment about the partnership that we've had here in Chicago. Uh, I've worked on a number of uh, governmental programs in my time, um, both here as well as uh, at CPS, where I was formerly their CFO. And I have never really worked on a program with as much partnership of, as we've seen here. Um, we have over 11 funders who have participated in this uh, program. They include Ken Griffin and Citadel, Crown Family Philanthropies, ITW, Pritzker Traubert Foundation, the Chicago Community Response Fund, the Chicago Community Trust, the JPB Foundation, President Barack Obama and Mrs. Michelle Obama, the MacArthur Foundation, the Joyce Foundation, Jones Day, um, as well as a partnership of our ISP providers, Comcast, RCN, and T-Mobile, and the United Way and Children's First Fund. 
Um, this also doesn't include the partnerships we've had with the 35 CBOs that I mentioned earlier, as well as CPS, as well as a number of the sister agencies in the city of Chicago, including Chicago Public Libraries, um, the Chicago Community Colleges, and uh, the Cook County Workforce uh, Partnership. And so I, I mentioned this to say it's not really just about the money and the uh, partnership and as it, respects, as, as it re relates to funding the program, um, but it's a lot about the uh, thought leadership and the collaboration we've had in developing this program and adjusting the program to become better as we implement it over time. One specific example of this is as we were having conversations with some of our funders, it became apparent that the interests of internet accessibility for students is important, but also uh, that there was a desire to expand that and leverage the work we were doing to help support workforce development. So if you think about internet access, um, the ability to get online, to um, put your career uh, you know, uh, credentials up online or learn a, a, another language or, uh, or improve your job skills um, was an important part of the work that we were doing. And so we've developed a whole arm of the program to address some of the other ways that we can leverage this program in that respect. Um, we're using Chicago Connected to help with the census sign up uh, work that we're doing, as well as some of the other activities of the city to really get the word out um, about how you can use internet in a lot of different ways. And then I would just end with, uh, uh, you know, one thought here, which is, as I've been doing this work, um, it's become apparent to me what a luxury it really is for me and my family to have access to high speed internet. Our family on average uses somewhere between 100 to 200 hours of internet a week. My husband teleworks, my kids do remote learning. And, um, and, and, and the fact that we have this access um, that many families don't really, um, you know, just highlights the disparities that we face as it relates to um, access to opportunity for families in Chicago and, and more broadly. And so I'm very excited to be here to talk about um, our initiative, hear about the initiative of, of others and to be able to engage in this dialogue. Thanks, Jenny, and thanks for your leadership in Chicago. I know the city's better for having you there. Um, the, uh, it, it just kind of points out that, you know, we are all living through this. Some of us are able to sort of navigate it better because we have more resources, but um, everybody has been affected, particularly during this pandemic, and, and being able to understand the folks kind of at the other end of the spectrum, it's, it's so important to be able to figure out how to solve this problem. And a lot of partnerships, a lot of partnerships there. Um, speaking of partnerships, Seth, you kind of represent a different aspect of our partnerships. Uh, maybe you can give us some perspective. Yes, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good to be with you. Uh, my name is Seth Hubbard. I'm the executive director of Tech Exchange. Uh, and Tech Exchange is a nonprofit based out of Oakland that serves the Bay Area with digital inclusion services. So there's a, a couple of things that we do. Um, we aim to help families with free or low-cost computers. Uh, we also are, are helping students and families um, access internet, uh, both through uh, free subsidized services or just through helping um, them learn about available offers and what, what uh, processes they need to go through to get competitive rates. Um, and then the last piece is we provide digital skills supports and training. So we have um, a tech support team and we have different level of uh, multilingual digital skills trainers that are um, working in the community, helping uh, individuals with those preliminary baseline skills in order to um, take the access that, that we're providing them um, and then level up so that they can start to um, complete some of the, the tasks that they're aiming to accomplish. Um, and so we've been around doing this work since the mid 90s and, and can certainly say that um, during these months of COVID, the um, mission and the need for our services has put on a whole nother platform and, and level. So I'll be also uh, excited to share some of the work that we're doing in partnership with the Mayor's Office of Oakland and the Oakland Unified School District and Public Education Fund um, on a campaign called Oakland Undivided, uh, where we're reaching 25,000 students with um, devices and internet connectivity and, and ongoing support. Um, but a, a first a word about the kind of scope of the issue, even in Bay Area, which you think is you know, tech saturated, there's the, all the, the tech players of the world are based um, in the Bay Area. Uh, but, you know, disappointingly, there's still 1.5 million residents in the Bay Area that are lacking connectivity, which is uh, such a travesty, um, given the, the overall resources that, that the region has. And so that's about 20% of the overall population. And then when you really look at the uh, areas that are most underserved, looking at those um, zip codes and census blocks that 
are you know having really so high socioeconomic pressures uh, that that connectivity rate jumps to 40 or 50 percent of households that don't have what they need at home and in today's reality of doing education online jobs online uh, ordering your groceries online like it is a, a need that has been there for the you know years that we've been working but has been um you know put in a place now where we need to solve this we need to to solve this quickly and so there's a couple of ways that we approach the three legs of the stool the the computers the internet and then the ongoing tech support um, for the computer piece we operate a large warehouse space in the western part of oakland where we uh, refurbish computers that we get donated from companies um, across Northern California. And so we have both staff technicians, but then also we have a workforce development program where we have youth come in and learn technical skills um, in our rebuilding and, and refurbishing computers that then we ultimately turn out to those in the community that are um, unconnected or unconnected at home. So the refurbishing model is a big component of what we do. Um, and then on the internet connectivity side and training side, we're very active with our partnerships. I think that that's going to be a recurring theme throughout um, this morning's conversation of uh, we work with schools and public housing sites, clinics, other community based organizations, and we often work with their clients at their facilities to bring resources, trainings and um, workshops to help families sign up for internet and then provide that, that ongoing uh, training and support. Um, and then lastly, we have kind of the traditional tech support genius bar um, community center where anybody can stop by and uh, get help with getting a computer, get, sign up for internet um, or, or sign up for different workshops and classes. Uh, and then transitioning to our large initiative now that we're doing in, in partnership with um, the city of Oakland uh, is called Oakland Undivided. And it was really launched um, right as shelter in place happened in the spring, knowing that a large number of Oakland students aren't connected at home. And so the first um, you know, month and, and a half was putting parameters around you know, what is the scope of the issue and what type of resources would it take in order to fully address it, knowing that um, we wanted to get students online now, but also have it not be a temporary solution, use this as a moment to think about systemically addressing the digital divide in Oakland in an uh, ongoing way and not just you know, a Band-Aid solution. And so we put together a campaign that was um, $12.5 million in scope and it was uh, quickly funded largely by um, the help of Jack Dorsey, uh, who contributed a large amount of, of funding to get the project off the ground. And so throughout the summer and now as the school year has started, we're actively executing on that uh, with the, the partners of the campaign. And we've uh, provided 15,000 computers out to students and um, helped them with uh, hotspot connectivity at home. And we're also uh, soon rolling in the uh, wired solution to help families that that's a, a better um, fit for. So there's good progress, a lot more work to be done. Um, but join the, the rest of the uh, panelists today with just excitement that, you know, this issue um, is making uh, such quick progress during these months of COVID. And I think that there's now opportunity to um, accelerate the work that is underway so that we can really make a dent in not only, you know, the region of uh, where, where I am in um, Oakland, but this is a California issue. This is a national issue. So uh, I'm appreciative that more and more eyeballs are uh, paying attention to um, this being a, a real um, important topic that uh, we, we as a nation need to address fully and address quickly. So thank you. Pleasure to be with you all. Thanks, Seth. That's really inspiring work. And uh, thank you. I, I, uh, we have a similar program in Los Angeles, and it, it, it is a labor of love and building one piece of it at a time. So I, uh, I hear the, the effort and uh, the history there and what you said. Um, Jordan, you're neighboring there to Seth and, uh, from Oakland. There, how are things in San Jose? And, and I know that you've been doing some exciting work on eradicating the digital divide. Absolutely. Thank you, Jeannie. Yep, yeah, and uh, you know, it's great to, have, to see Seth here. You know, they are one of our partners in our digital inclusion fund. So San Jose's population is about a little bit over a million and we're the 10th largest here city in the US. And you know, Mayor Sam Licardo has really 
you know, has always reminded me as, as chief innovation officer of a very important man, mantra, which is that we always need to view our initiatives through the lens of our most underserved residents in need. And so as the city's leader in tech innovation, I cannot consciously say my initiatives towards building uh, the city of the future are truly inclusive if I have not actively addressed uh, the digital divide. Um, and so back in 2017, Mayor St. Licardo has really continued to emphasize the fight to resolve the digital divide, as well as the homework gap that plagues our community. And so to give you a little bit of perspective of what we're facing here, you know, we have over 100,000 residents who are under or unconnected. Uh, that's roughly to be about 50,000 households. And this breaks down more or less to 48% uh, of our black households suffer uh, from the digital divide, coupled with 35% from our Latinx community uh, who don't have broadband access. Uh, but that's not to say that we also have another actually 25%, mostly uh, Vietnamese and other Southeast Asian communities that also suffer from this issue. Um, and our goal really is to bridge the digital divide for 50,000 households. And we uh, have a very ambitious target of aiming at 4,000 households per year to address that. And so currently we have a couple of, uh, or three key digital inclusion efforts underway. Uh, first of all, we have our uh, $4.8 million that was directed by uh, the mayor for community Wi-Fi projects. We have delivered over 11,000 Wi-Fi hotspots in partnership with AT&T uh, to mostly our students, but also other residents in need. And then we have our $24 million digital inclusion fund in partnership with the California Emerging Technology Fund, as well as uh, TextChange is one of our grantees, um, where we have about roughly $10 million contributed by the telcos. That includes AT&T, Verizon, and Mobility uh, is Sprint, uh, or now T-Mobile. Um, and really, you know, as of today, I'm really excited to announce that we've actually exceeded over 4,000 households who at least have a device. And some, base, and some with basic connectivity at home. And so we're really pushing forward despite what COVID has, you know, how COVID has thrown a wrench in a lot of our operations because we did launch in January or, or late December. Um, and so right now, you know, the immediate urgency facing us and, and particularly our school districts is the device shortage. Uh, and roughly we have about 27,000 devices that still need to be fielded to our students for distance learning. Great, thank you so much. Um, it's just, it's, it's inspiring to hear what everybody's doing and I know how hard it's been to get there. Um, at the same time, I do wanna do a bit of a reality check. There is a lot of data that everyone just shared about the continuing gap. So we're all working hard on making this happen, but there's really this opportunity for partnerships um, that we can carry into the future and try and address the need um, some of the things were pretty stark, 50% uh, of households, I think Seth said in Oakland and certainly in Los Angeles and our, our, some of our poorest communities in South LA and Watts and Pacoima, 50% of households don't have internet at home. And what we're finding in reality is that some of that data may not even be as true as, as we are seeing with the number of kids who are di getting disconnected. As we started LA Unified School District virtual in the spring, and now going full virtual for the year. In that spring semester, we saw a 40% drop off rate. And when we looked at our homeless and foster care youth, 92% of kids were basically unable to connect to classes. 92% uh, of our most at risk kids not able to get the education that they desperately need. So, so as we kind of look forward to this, um, I just wanna open up some questions here. And now, now that you've heard about some of these successes and challenges, I'd like to get a little more specific about how we've arrived at some of the strategies that, that all of you have just talked about. Jenny, maybe I can start with you. Um, what are some of the best practices that you are drawing upon to design your digital equity strategy? Sure. Um, so we started out by uh, first defining eligibility. Uh, there was a lot of discussion around whether we um, open up the program to a survey um, of parents who had need versus um, what we felt were eligibility metrics that would serve the most at need students. Um, there um, uh, fortunately has been a good cross section of that. So it's not been a mutually exclusive decision of one versus the other, but as we defined our eligibility metrics, we think that given the size of the program, we've covered basically all of the need by way of internet accessibility, but also need by way of families who may not be able to afford internet, but are really just making do because they know how essential it is. 
Um, and so um, there was a lot of policy making at the outset to decide upon how we got there. I would imagine that the circumstances would be different in a lot of different um, uh, uh, cities and towns that are looking to do the same. Um, but we did a lot of work around um, looking at the data of who would be eligible under this program and who were recovering and who may have need and just making sure that we were covering that entire need. Um, as I mentioned, there was a census data that was done. Kids for Chicago um, did a report uh, in collaboration with the Metropolitan Planning Council um, uh, to highlight the need for internet accessibility and where it existed. Um, and then in addition to that, since we started the program, we've been able to do fairly in-depth data analytics around this to get to the specific households that have uh, need for internet. Um, the other thing I mentioned earlier relates to meeting families where they are, and this has been criti critically important as we've uh, kicked, uh, stood up the program and, and started rolling it out. Uh, we hear back from families about specific needs that some of which we've um, uh, planned for at the outset that um, you know, end up being a lot about making sure we communicate that we've structured the program to support those needs, some of which we didn't anticipate in advance that we've been able to adjust accordingly based on the level of feedback we, we receive from all of our partners and, um, and the constant iteration that we're, we're, we're making upon the program. So one example of that is social security number. We're not requiring that, employ that uh, families who sign up have a social security number, which is very important for a certain segment of our population. Um, it was never a requirement and uh, it was very important for us as we were structuring this program. Um, importantly though, how you message that and how that's scripted in the communications and interactions that family ha families have with the ISP providers as well as our community-based organizations um, and, the, uh, and the CPS's um, community engagement specialists is really important because if you ask, do you have a social security number and then make the second question, um, but will accept other forms of ID, it has a very different impact on families and your sign up rate than just stating out front that we accept all forms of ID. And so there are little things like that that make a real difference in how it is that we're able to reach families, which ultimately is the end goal of the program, making sure we're reaching as many families as possible. Um, and we've done a lot of work around that. One other example I'll give is um, the debt relief um, that uh, we've implemented as a part of uh, the program. Uh, we, as the, the, one of the mayor's main platforms is fines and fees reform and making our way of collecting um, from uh, families who can less afford it more progressive. And importantly, um, you, do have to, you don't have to uh, resolve all of your prior debts with the ISP providers to be a part of our program. And that was an important part of the, um, uh, of the structuring of the program that, uh, that met our policy goals as well. So, just a few, you know, kind of examples of things that we spent a lot of time on from a policy perspective, which for us spending that time up front meant, you know, as we went through this program and rolled it out, there was, it was a lot more smooth process for us. Perfect. Josh or Jordan, do you want to add in on that? Uh, yes, I, I'll, um, I, I think everything that Jenny is saying is uh, spot on, so I'm not going to uh, re repeat that. Rather, uh, dr drill in on some of the other points that make our um, larger governance structure for Connect Through and Three a, a bit unique in that we've taken a bit of a community organizing approach. Um, you know, at the onset, we had realized, and this was in 2019, uh, that we needed some just necessary infrastructure to bridging the digital divide. And that necessary infrastructure uh, is replace a high emphasis on sustainability, meaning that we cannot look at this and whatever investment or even spend our way out of this issue. So it didn't matter how much money we raised, we needed to have the infrastructure in place, whereby if I'm a family uh, that doesn't have internet or doesn't have a computer, well, that's, that's going to be a constant population as long as you're living in an area with um, uh, historic po poverty. And so knowing that that's the case, we had uh, worked with, uh, uh, human IT uh, at the onset. Human IT is a, yeah, I see the thumbs up. Uh, yep, uh, Los Angeles-based uh, social, social enterprise. And uh, we were able to successfully fundraise to uh, get an operation landed in Detroit as well. These were recommendations that were made back in 2009 to have some type of infrastructure around um, um, computer refurbishment and redistribution in the community. And so that was something that we said, okay, before we do anything, let's make sure we have necessary infrastructure. And so when we actually got that infrastructure in place in our community, we're like, okay, cool. Uh, now let's actually look at activating things in a larger fashion. And so through Connect 313, we've created a, um, and we're still in the process of creating 
our community organizing governance structure, whereby we have verticals that correspond to the digital divide. Verticals we all know to be true, devices and connectivity, digital literacy and digital skilling, uh, advocacy and ecosystem with a sub focus on, on uh, policy activation, and then those shared resources that I mentioned earlier that the fund supports uh, by way of like the uh, community ambassadors is a larger piece. But at the end of this year, what we're actually going to be doing is holding resident elections for people who are going to be making, um, re literally residents actually being able to make recommendations within their community and getting that Connect 313 fund to be responsive to resident needs. Because one of our values that we really focus on is being uh, resident led, but expertly informed. And that's something that as we look at our Connect 313 uh, strategy, broadly speaking, placing a very high emphasis on values uh, but at the same time, making sure that we're not losing sight of our community and our community isn't just our residents. Our community is anyone who lives in Detroit, anyone who has work in Detroit or anyone who wants to work in Detroit. And so uh, making sure that that table is set so that, again, we're not looking at uh, one win on digital inclusion and acting as if we can high five off of that. This is going to be something that is going to be ongoing. And we've all digested that this is going to be a long fight. And so everything that we're doing is with sustainability in mind. It's an active process and it goes back to the fundamental roots of community organizing. Yeah, I think both of what you're saying is so important. The, the sustain so again, this is a marathon, not a sprint. We have just had sort of thrown into our faces the, the need to expedite the work on digital inclusion. It's not that we haven't been focusing on it at all, but, but the fact that it has become such an essential basic human right and service has just become so obvious during the pan this pandemic. And we see this kind of happening, Jenny, to what, what you were saying about, you know, when, when people started wanting to get internet access, if they had any debt, any debt at all, even $10 with an ISP, they couldn't get, they couldn't sign up again until they paid off that debt. And so, um, we also had worked with all the community, all the telecom companies to do debt forgiveness. So across the board, there was debt forgiveness for Angelinos who needed to get online, which just kind of cleared the air. Not only was it, you know, a relief to people to not have to have that bill facing them, but now they could get online with, uh, in many cases, free service for 60 days, or, or we have some offerings through the end of the calendar year and hopefully soon to be to the end of the school year. Um, and just being able to make that transition. And then also the friendliness, right? There's, um, doesn't always seem like big companies can be friendly <laughs> or even big government, but, um, but that friendliness and changing it from the questions of, I need your immigration status, I need your social security number, I need all of this other you know, information and history, I need your uh, uh, financials to qualify for a program, to just being, are you, do you believe you're eligible under one of these programs? That's great. Okay, so let's get a name and address. Um, and and that, that has changed a lot of the, a lot of the conversation. Um, but let's pivot really kind of and focus more in on philanthropy because all of you have mentioned the role that philanthropy has, philanthropy has played and, and probably the bigger role that philanthropy can play. Um, so Seth, I know you've been very involved in this effort. How can effective public, private, and philanthropic partnerships be designed and implemented really to, to drive us towards excellence, um, especially not just at the national level, but at the local level? Sure, so, so needed. And I think it, it kind of comes back to how complex an issue uh, digital inclusion and, and the digital divide is, because there's so many interrelated components. There's first just the infrastructure, which, you know, many parts of rural California still don't have even the, the kind of backbone and able to get online, um, even if they did have a device. Um, but once that is set, then there's the element around helping a family with uh, actual physical hardware, like getting a device, and there's costs associated with that that are often prohibitive for families, especially to renew on an ongoing basis. Um, but then there's the internet costs, which again, um, you know, is, is uh, a cost that a family will, will need to sustain. And um, depending on the plan that they're on can um, really put a, a dent in their pocketbook and they need some sort of subsidy for that to be realistic with their, their family budget. And then there's the skill training and the making sure that families are receiving this information in culture and in language. So there's a lot of elements to solving this issue that of course all need to be resourced. So at, at the end of the day, it, you know, philanthropic partners are so instrumental in helping provide that, you know, working capital so that innovations can happen on all of those different fronts. And so the, you know, kind of perspective that I look at, at it 
to, you know, when we, we work with interested philanthropic partners is because it's so complex and it touches so many parts of community members' lives, like, what is your interest area? Is it education? Is it workforce development? Is it access to healthcare? Like, digital inclusion touches all of that. So there's a, a variety of ways and a variety of needs that philanthropic partners can plug in. Um, and, and I would say that funding is, of course, the, the one that uh, helps make this go around, but there are other elements that are equally as helpful to have um, engagement and input from philanthropic partners. So with our model, we're always looking for um, computers that are donated. So we look, work with a lot of institutional funders and some um, you know, corporate uh, foundations on we're getting computers that are being retired by some of these large companies so that we can repurpose them and get them out to uh, community members that need them. So there's in-kind donations that can be part of this solution. And then also um, volunteering and, and just rallying those uh, extra hands uh, in volunteering that way um, in order to uh, you know, help with events or help with virtual sessions. There's just a lot of ways to plug in if people are are willing to contribute time as well. So money, tech, and time are kind of what it takes for this to go around. And um, we're always looking for partners that are, are helping to plug in because the, the need is so great that we need a lot of contributions and resources in order to fully address it. And Seth, I'll also add one other thing, which is really awareness. So just making sure that people are aware that they uh, often have the ability to get a free device or a low-cost device or free or low-cost internet. Um, right. I think there's, you know, a, a mis like a lack of communication. And I know that many of the partners on this call today have huge networks that they can get that information out and often are trusted in different ways than government may or may not be trusted. <laughs> and so getting that, uh, or even that the you know, telecom companies can be trusted or not trusted. So getting that information out in creative ways, I think is really important. Um, but, but yeah, it's not just an issue of ca cash is always welcome, but it's not just an issue of cash. It's, it's an issue of what we can do together as a community. And, and kind of in that sense of sort of these broad issues around regional partnerships, Jordan, I, I, again, being part of Seth's community there, um, how can we foster stronger regional relationships around these digital equity strategies that cities are putting together? I mean, what's happening with San Jose on this? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I, I think part of it is, is, is stronger. The other part is the timeline aspect, right? So um, I came from traditionally a background of, of healthcare uh, specifically in digital health and medical devices, as, as well as in venture. And so the lens of how I look at partnerships, very, diff very much so difference between the problems you're trying to solve and the solution you're trying to bring to the table. And so with digital inclusion, you know, as Seth alluded to, this is a multifaceted problem of, of our society. And, and there is no unique solution per se for every group of, or specific community. And so we always have to do a little bit of tailoring dependent on on digital fluency, race, uh, and, and economics. Um, but I would say, you know, for us, um, the way we foster stronger relationships is one, obviously, through or participating in organizations such as Michelson Foundation. So, you know, tipping my hat to y'all for bringing together a variety of stakeholders here. Um, the other part is, you know, reaching more broadly uh, across the state of California and saying, look, hey, are other Californians facing similar issues with specific um, uh, segments of your population. And so, you know, while we are based in San Jose, you know, we do have, you know, an informal partnership uh, with uh, folks in LA, such as Everyone On, you know, and, and them being able to serve our community in terms of deli delivering more digital literacy. As I mentioned, our digital inclusion fund, the hallmark of this is emphasizing digital literacy piece of this to really sustain uh, once we've crossed the digital divide. The other is, you know, obviously our broader state level engagement, such as with our partner, our strategic partner here, the California Emerging Technology Fund and, uh, and Sunny McPeak and her work and, and influence there. And then finally, I think it's really, you know, once you've got all the folks at the table, then you've aligned the focus and identified the problems, right? The other part is then, okay, how do you engage? And so then to shift gears from talking about nonprofits versus, let's say, other uh, cities, you know, our sister cities, uh, you know, our mayor did something really powerful uh, a few months ago, which is, look, let's form the big city mayors, you know, including uh, Mayor Garcetti down in L.A. there. And, and really, let's focus on what really we need to push the ISPs 
more for it, right? And so that's COVID internet policies uh, that extend services to removing barriers to enrollment. And so it's, it's multifaceted, the problem is multifaceted, the solutions also then need to be tailored to address those specific problems, whether it's partnerships and not-for-profits and being boots on the ground, or is it more policy level in terms of, you know, pushing both corporate and, uh, you know, higher uh, regional government uh, stakeholders. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, I think it just, it, it kind of tees up this idea about what, what the future could look like, like all the things that we're doing today and, and how we could be different into the future. Um, and so let me uh, shift over to Josh, because um, you've done such an amazing sort of groundbreaking work in Detroit. Um, what is the potential for doing more? I mean, right now we're, I, I feel like a lot of what we're doing is sort of stopping a gap here and stopping a gap there and, and making sure that we start to plan a little bit for the future, but it's, it's a very much needing to move now very quickly. What, but what role should the public, private and philanthropic sectors be playing? That is a fantastic question and one that uh, probably cut me up last night. Uh, <laughs> I'll say that, you know, when I look at the digital divide, um, there's, a, there's a silent S to it. Uh, we just say it because it's easier for people to understand when we're saying, oh, digital divide is it's a binary thing, but look at it more so as a, a, as a, a, a crystal. <laughs> and I don't mean to get too philosophical, but there's so many angles to it that when, yes, you're talking about right now, everyone is talking about um, internet access and, and, and broadband specifically. And I think that we're right to do it. That makes the most sense, but there are multiple digital divides that exist beyond that. Uh, how people use the internet, um, even folks feeling comfortable in certain things, how we're looking at age tech. And if you have an aging America right now, what does that mean when we're looking at um, 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 digital infrastructure? as it intersects with social infrastructure. Even there's a question right now in the Q&A portion about privacy. I, I know Jordan and I have talked about cybersecurity. We are at the tip of the iceberg. And, you know, for the life of me, I, I want to commend everybody who is doing great work on the ground. I want to commend people who are doing great work in Washington. But at the same time, I think that we are really, really missing the mark and shooting ourselves in the foot if we only look at this as a binary issue of who has internet and who doesn't. And so this is something where I think philanthropy is in a very unique position to do exactly what they have historically done. And that is sitting on top of, of, of a perch and not necessarily saying that they're superior to us. However, that they have a different outlook on things as we need to move our regions forward. They're uniquely positioned to be able to stir those conversations and be a great co-signer to the work that's already being done. But at the same time, being able to plant seeds to say, hey, and while you're doing this work, please be mindful of these things. And so uh, it, it's no secret in my background, I'm also coming from working at the Cleveland Foundation. And working at the Cleveland Foundation, the world's first community foundation, that was ingraining in our heads how we need to be approaching our work um, specifically as well as this digital divide. And I think that when you're looking at philanthropic entities, I, I'm almost intentionally refusing to refer to them as just as funders because yes, they are funders, but they're more than that. They are our thought partners. They are our community members. They are people that are able to see, again, different angles of this issue. But at the same time, uh, our corporations, and when, when, when we're looking at them, it's specifically looking at some of the partners we have in Detroit. We have General Motors, who has uh, leaned in heavily to support what we're doing. And you might ask why. Well, as General Motors is looking at pivoting and getting much more invested in electric vehicles, and as Ford is doing the same thing, and as Detroit is rebranding itself as the mobility capital of the United States, these are things that, um, as these other, other industries are, are realigning their perspectives, we can't lose sight of the fact that this larger digital divide conversation bleeds into it. And if we're going to keep them as separate discussions, we do ourselves a disservice when digital divide 3.0 or digital divide 4.0 comes around. And so I think that is our responsibility as local leaders on the ground, specifically if you are in government, to be working at the intersection of philanthropy's ability to go that higher perch to see that, that larger worldview. And at the same time, look at what the corporate trends and say, how do I align and best position my community so that we're not looking at um, 6G and looking at the divide between who has 4G and who has 6G. And so uh, really we don't have much time to get this wrong much longer. And so this is a, 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 a plea and a, and a, and a you know, high five to everyone doing the work, but us not to lose sight of this larger picture and that we are just getting started. I couldn't agree more, Josh. Um, and again, I think I think that's why this becomes this once in a generation opportunity, right? So, so we've gone from an environment where in a 4G, really 3G still, 3G and 4G world, that we, for example, in LA, we had 1500 small cells across the city, which 
may seem like a lot or not a lot, depending on how big your city is, but it's really not a lot in Los Angeles, uh, 500 square miles, 4 million people. Uh, we are in the midst of a build out with our telecom companies of about 10,000 small cells across the city. But the, the way in which we permit those gives us this opportunity to govern that sort so that when we come to 6G, we don't leave behind empty areas. Um, we've already been able in the two years we've been a 5G city, so we're the first 5G city in the Western Hemisphere. Hey, um, but uh, as that, we've been able to get rid of all of the gaps of service. So there's no place in LA that you can't that you can't get service. And now we're working to make sure that every place is covered by two or three to have a competition in those areas. And I think I think that's the opportunity is is if as a city we can govern things in a way that we now uh, encourage or coerce or support companies. Uh, and the permit deployment in the digitally divided areas where we need to continue to build up that capability and that infrastructure, that then lays the groundwork, the hard groundwork that others cannot do. Only really cities can do that to be able to then build on now that that infrastructure is there, how do we make it just blossom? Um, and, and so while that's a hopeful vision, this, some it is sort of dancing around the issue that what we found is this internet connectivity is really essential to our lives today. And with COVID distancing, remote learning and work, basic access to education and services, all needing both the internet and a device, we're finding huge gaps around racial equity, digital redlining, issues around poverty, language, immigration, all of the factors around equity that we all care about and maybe focus on one area or another, even gender equity, where we're finding that now as the school year has started, more women are having to drop out of the permanent workforce because they're having to be um, sort of the stay at home mom because their kids are now at home, even if they're online learning. So, so Seth, we're really in this area where we are looking at whether the internet has really become a public utility. So how can public-private partnerships, Seth, help um, collaborate to make the internet access a basic public utility? Yeah, now is the time for those conversations to happen in a more expedited fashion, because I think that there now is a, a more general public understanding that internet is a basic human need. I mean, we are using it for every part of our daily lives right now. Um, and there's a, a emphasis on, you know, making sure that it's not cost prohibitive and there's not too many hoops to jump through for the most underserved families that are currently disconnected. And so I think that philanthropy can play a role in, in this kind of movement to or towards internet become a public, public utility by both being a, a spark and a convener. Um, I mean, cities are at such different places with Kind of their roadmap or their strategy or even their way of thinking around this issue um, and often you know it, it with philanthropy's help it can be that um, consultant that you know comes and can do a cost analysis of what would it take or launch a pilot so that um, we can see you know this tried and true in action so i think that there's ways to kind of start some sparks in different ways that will then catch momentum and become um, more of a a comprehensive approach at the municipal level. Um, I'd also then on the kind of convening and best practice sharing, like there are cities that are doing this really well that need to be elevated and um, their strategy and approach should be um, replicated and, and shared with others and tailored, of course, but um, there's that element of uh, often we're caught in silos doing this work and philanthropy can play a big role in helping break through those silos. I mean, even through things like today's conversation of bringing people together that are doing the same work, but from multiple perspectives. And um, I think more of that is what's gonna be needed to kind of help on this roadmap. I mean, I'm even thinking of um, San Jose has taken such a, a leadership role in kind of the rollout of 5G and how to make sure the bake in digital inclusion and equity to have a sustainable revenue model based on that innovative approach. And so that's something that, you know, might not be replicated to the hundredth degree by other cities, but there's a lot to learn there that other, other municipalities can, um, as they're being creative with bringing in the next technology, um, whatever it is, 6G, 7G into their city, like make sure that we have our head up and that we're, we're working together and sharing best practices on all of this. So that, that's my two cents. Yeah, I think that's so important. And, and although we're talking a lot about kids today, kind of to echo back to what Josh had mentioned too, is, is uh, silver tech. So silver tech is tech that's geared around our senior population and elderly. 
they're getting left behind even at more frightening rates, actually. So while there's a lot of focus on making sure kids can get online learning, our seniors are having huge issues with social isolation uh, as families aren't able to have the regular connection that they have. Um, and as they're not able to get out into community sur support and services that they normally get. So, and, and there's the digital literacy challenge there. So this, this whole aspect of COVID gives us a bit of a reality check. And so Jordan, with all of this, uh, all of this going on with, with the economic downturn and therefore city and regional government budgets getting thoroughly slashed and uh, to really painful levels. Um, what are some of the timelines that we can think about for cultivating this kind of collaborative, effective, cross-sectoral partnership? And, and maybe what role does technology play? How, how can we make this all happen at the need of speed? Thank you. Yeah, I think, you know, it's, it, I, I think everybody gets the point now, you know, especially with the media hype, it, it, the time is now to address the digital divide. And particularly, you know, as we ride this wave or momentum, you know, where the economy hasn't fully fallen off the cliff quite yet, nobody can predict that. But we really need to get ahead of this and say, look, you know, there are partnerships big and small, and how do you scope it out from a project management perspective, right? And so just to give you all context, our digital inclusion fund took almost close to two years from launch from concept to launch um, in terms of aligning funding from the telcos bringing on the grantees and, and, and incredible partners such as Seth's team and then executing on that vision um, and you know when I came on board some of the interesting things I saw you know putting my operator hat on is okay look you know how can we accelerate this how can we get ready for a hockey stick growth moment uh, for adoption right and so the way I look at my our platform here for digital inclusion is one it's marketing Right. And particularly, how do you get the word out to those who are under or unconnected in a digital era? Right. And so we've done partnerships with Univision uh, to get some of this word out. We've done, you know, mailed uh, flyers with uh, our county of education, coupled with uh, our uh, water bills as well. And so you'll find that if you're a San Jose resident receiving water bills uh, for information on digital inclusion. Um, the other part is on you know, strategy and ops um, and really being data driven. And I kind of see our efforts, especially when we work with our community-based organizations, it's almost our evangelists or retailers, if you will, um, who are in the community, um, you know, getting, ado getting adoptions for low cost folks to get access to low cost internet plans, providing a device and getting liter digital literacy training. And so, you know, we have to really be able to capture that data, circle back to on any touch points to ensure that folks don't churn from these programs. Uh, and ultimately ensure that we have a way to then bring more, leverage more powers of technology, such as to address economic mobility, um, particularly as we face deeper crises. And the final part is on uh, funding. You know, I think this is where, once again, I tip my hat to folks who are philanthropists. Um, CARES Act funding has been great to accelerate our efforts. Um, we've also partnered with Santa Clara County of Education, pooling resources for the homework gap, uh, but we need more. Um, but it's, you know, funding is one of the great uh, enablers uh, in, in our world to be able to uh, bring those timelines down and get people focused uh, because we all know the money's here, but it might not be there in the future. Absolutely. Um, so I'm going to do one more question to all of you and then switch to the ones coming up from the audience. Um, so Jenny, and let me turn back to Chicago for a moment here. Um, it's hard to believe, but there will be a time after COVID. <laughs> There'll be a time in which we're, we all start uh, reconnecting and reconvening and getting back together. Although that time is likely to look very different. I think we're even seeing that as some communities start to reopen and still a lot of folks are, uh, some are jumping in and some are quite shy about, about doing that. Um, what if any opportunities have you in Chicago identified in COVID's aftermath? Do you anticipate people continue to work remotely? What new opportunities do you think are gonna come out for new businesses like new entertainment options, right? We're seeing a huge surge in esports and gaming revenue um, and internet companies as well, while a like a dramatic devastation in the physical theater com community. Um, so what's the situation in Chicago? How do you think the future is going to look in a post COVID world for digital equity? Sure. So I think it's clear that no matter what, post-COVID, the way that we access uh, uh, community is going to change and, and likely to be more digital in nature. Um, at the very least, as it relates to the school uh, aspect of it and, and, and where Chicago Connected is right now, 
no matter what, some form of hybrid or remote learning will be a critical part of learning for the foreseeable future. And especially with education where every day really matters and every day lost really matters, um, we know that that's gonna be a permanent part of the construct that we have to solve towards. As it relates to Chicago more broadly, um, you know, we are seeing a changing pattern as it relates to, for example, teleworking that you noted. Um, it's adjusted, uh, for example, our revenue streams and which revenue streams may be stronger or less strong in this current environment. Um, we, you mentioned gaming. We are actually in the midst of expanding gaming within Chicago and, uh, and more broadly in the state of Illinois and are working on a uh, strategy towards that. I think what I would say at a high level is, um, you know, we are doing some work as a part of this upcoming budget, but also in general as a city to think about what life looks like under COVID and reimagining how we um, implement government, um, but also uh, change our lives post COVID. I don't have a good answer for you right now because I think we're still in the midst of it and we're still trying to figure out how long this is gonna last, um, what this really means for us in terms of how we live with each other and interact with each other. But we're already seeing the effects of that. Um, uh, the theaters have uh, been very challenged. And so we're seeing a lot of ways where um, people are trying to um, uh, commune uh, in, in a virtual environment. Uh, our um, Department of, uh, 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 of uh, Special Events has, in essence, uh, put up a number of virtual events, including um, uh, some of the big events that you might uh, recognize in Chicago, um, uh, like Taste of Chicago, for example, and others. And so we're doing a lot of work to figure that out. I, you know, don't, I wouldn't pr pretend to say that we've got the answer yet, but we do know that it's gonna change, uh, per, change pretty drastically and, and are gonna work to try to adjust to that. Great, thanks so much. So let me turn to some questions from our audience. Uh, here's a great one. So I'll open this up to whoever is brave enough to answer. This is from Emmanuel. Um, is privacy included in the various programs presented today? And could, you, could we access the privacy statement related to those? So I guess I could start. Um, I don't. We. Uh, I know as a part of uh, the discussion points with our ISP providers. Um, you know, we um, have uh, uh, endeavored to prevent. I think some of the concerns that may have been there in the past as it relates to the use of information, how that information's um, being uh, used by certain of our uh, partners, and the long and the short of it is, is that we're not. You know, allowing for um, you know that information to be used elsewhere. Um, as it relates to broader privacy related to information, um, uh, you know, there are, you know, just the traditional issues that will come up related to account information, et cetera. We've engaged in um, efforts with our citizen utility board in order to help create some consumer protection rights around um, what our uh, residents are experiencing. And, um, and, and, I, and, I, and I think it's important to note that this is truly a collaborative process. Um, you know, we haven't had an instance where, you know, we've had to, you know, uh, you, know you know, kind of go toe to toe on an issue where we've had an, we've had problems. Um, you know, the ISP providers have been real partners to us through all of this. And as issues have come up, they've been very creative in looking at ways that we can work around some of these more sensitive issues. And I, you know, I have to commend the, again, the partnership that we have here in Chicago and being able to address some of those issues. Yeah. And I would add on to that in, in terms of privacy, you know, we take it obviously very seriously here in, in San Jose as well. And I, I see it in kind of three things from a digital inclusion fund perspective. You know, we are very sensitive in terms of, you know, the, the, the walls and who has access to what data uh, in terms of our residents getting connected. And so we really trust our community based organizations to help ensure that because they quite frankly have the most, you know, the deepest person to person uh, trust with those community members. Um, in terms of, you know, a broader issue, you know, Josh and I uh, are, are really, uh, we're, we're kind of nerding out on this, but it's really important to think about securing our digital sidewalks. Um, and so when you think about bringing masses of people who are, were never connected uh, into being connected 24 seven, you really have to consider the aftermath impacts of that from cyber crime to other sort of financial crime and just general uh, social engineered, um, uh, even, cyberbullying. Um, and, and, and so we have to be very deliberate about that and, and look at opportunities where technology can play a role uh, in us being able to do more to secure those, that digital uh, sidewalk. Because ultimately, you can't talk about privacy and data rights without security these days. 
Perfect. And then there's another question from Quentin Wilson. What individual or group contact did you anyone have with large numbers of community members before determining the unique and appropriate plugin um, solutions for connecting residents to resources in their area? So in what way have you gotten community feedback and what in what ways do you continue to do that? I, Josh, I, I see you laughing. <laughs> <laughs> well, be, because that, that uh, Quentin, that, that is exactly the concern that I was working around uh, because I knew it was going to be the case. Uh, and I would say that if you look at most uh, major urban digital divides in these underserved commu communities, you had a lot of your internet providers who built out infrastructure believing that, oh, well, if we build it, people are going to use it, right? And it's like, well, not necessarily. I think you're going to get some, but there's a larger play, which is why we've been in Detroit going with this community organizing model approach. We're like, hey, let's look at all of our residents. Let's look at our churches. Let's look at existing entities that have the social capital and do that outreach and bring them on board. And so, as I said, at the very end of our year this year, we are going to be holding resident elections. And yes, I understand there's gonna be election fatigue and census fatigue and all those other things. So timing wasn't our best friend here. However, uh, holding the actual elections where residents are going to be leading the work on the ground. So that way it's not gonna come down to oh, well, Josh, what do you think is best for small businesses in Detroit to bridge the digital divide? Or what do you think is best for this neighborhood to bridge the digital divide? And it's like, no, our residents know what's best. And it's up to me to make sure that we are stewarding and um, 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 protecting the investments that are going to be made, largely speaking, and making sure that my corporate and other public officials are aligned here. But at the end of the day, we're making sure it's resident-led. And we're doing that by um, doing very, very robust outreach. And uh, actually, every single week and right after this call i have a uh, two two meetings as it relates to connect through and three one on our devices and connectivity one on our structure and governance and those are calls that every single week we're seeing it the, them grow and at the end of each month we have our connect through and three community conversations all these are open to the public and we are using our city council and their positioning to make sure that we're having penetration into communities for people who are who believe in their council members but in addition, we're getting the wraparound from any and other, any, any and all public leaders who um, um, uh, have some type of skin in the game here uh, and, and at least want to bridge this digital divide in Detroit. So ours is definitely rooted in community organizing principles and making sure that we are getting as many residents as possible weighing in on our process. Judy, if I could, I'd like to uplift what Josh just said, because the community based aspect of this has been so critical for us. Um, we, you know, have engaged the 35 community-based organizations that I mentioned, but, but, but really more so, not just that, the 30-point marketing plan, which included a lot of um, dialogue with our church community, with others, mostly just to reinforce the fact that that um, feedback and the ability to be able to understand exactly what residents need um, is so critical to a successful program. And I don't think really anybody starting any program could, could at the outset know exactly what's right because every community is gonna have a very different need as well. And making sure there's that um, feedback loop and ability to listen has been really important to us in garnering uh, success in this program. And I think also importantly, um, you know, making sure that people feel like it's a program that serves them and that, uh, and that momentum builds on itself to allow for better fundraising and you know more excitement around the program to extend the duration and the permanence of the program. Yeah, that's also important. Um, we have two questions that are somewhat related and I'm thinking might be a quick answer. So from both Teresa and Elizabeth, um, they're looking for some of the current statistics uh, for California, which um, I can make sure we send out to all the participants later, um, but also like what resources have you used to identify areas and households that lack connectivity and devices? I know for LA, we do a lot of maps that we provide to folks that overlay uh, several different things. So our current map has uh, FCC data that tells us how many households are connected through broadband, but that data can be a little deceiving because if even one house in a block is connected, then they count all the houses as connected. So it's when we talk about 50% connectivity, it's actually much worse than that. And then we overlay on that same map um, information about poverty, socioeconomic need, and, uh, and where there's free Wi-Fi hotspots. Because if you're in one of those digitally divided neighborhoods, you wanna know where there's a safe, reliable, free place to go to get connected. What have some of you all done around pulling up some of this data that you've been talking about? Yeah, we, we've uh, done the same of some map overlays. Um, I mean, we largely rely on some American community survey data if we don't have anything that 
is more kind of coming from the community, from any surveying or any like real data uh, from our organization or from our partners. Um, so if we're looking at just high level data, we've found that to be helpful, at least an indicator, even though that there definitely are some air bars to be <laughs> aware of uh, looking at some of the ACS data. Um, and the California wide, um, I've appreciated and used California Emerging Technology Fund as an annual survey um, that has some good breakdowns around connectivity, both geographically and through um, different socioeconomic indicators. And so that's, of course, specific to California, um, but it's been a resource that I've uh, found helpful. Yeah, and the County of Education, Santa Clara County of Education also has on their website um, device gaps as well as uh, digital divide needs for internet connectivity. And so and you can kind of see some of the digital redlining, you know, that occurs, un un unfortunately. Uh, and, you know, these are areas obviously that we need to tackle and, and, and really double down more into. Yeah. It's, it's been the same. Yeah, the, the, the mapping, like, I, I think that that's been pretty standard. And, um, you know, one of the things where why we began focusing much more on establishing a data trust. And fundamentally, we had said that, look, we don't want this to be a data trust where we're looking at maybe three or four data sets. It should actually be unlimited. And so as many more data sets are becoming available, it's just adding more to the precision that we need to say, hey, definitively, not even this census tract or not even this neighborhood, specifically, what are our streets that we need to be focusing on? Because one thing that we know to be true, that the corporate ISP model it works where it works. And I think that I'm not disparaging them. I think that it's, it's, it's great. It's been enough of a model for America to be able to get on, uh, on board with, but there needs to be places where if you have the data at the level that you need it, you're able to then justify why community networks work in the context of where they could work. And the only way you're gonna be able to get to that in a, um, a, a way that's going to get the philanthropic and corporate investments to support something like that is through uh, a data trust that gives you the precision that you need. And so for us, that is where we've been able to pivot from the original mapping that we were able to do backed by ACS and some surveying to say, okay, let's get, let's take this one step further. Let's actually get some real dollars behind this. And then hopefully we can show the FCC um, how it's done. I, I, I don't even, I'm not even pulling a punch there. I, I, I mean it. I mean, it's, it's, it's sad that all of us have to add a qualifier to the FCC's Form 477 data. Why are we making up uh, amends for the federal government? I, I don't know, it's terrible. And so this is something where for us, um, we would like to be able to showcase how local communities are empowering local communities in the absence of where the federal government should be giving us a little bit more uh, support. Great, so, um, so we've come near the end of our time. What I'd like to do is ask all of you to be brief. So 60 seconds. Give me a call to action. We've got over 100 people on this call today, amazing folks in lots of different sectors of industry and philanthropy and government. Um, what is your call to action and what is your request to our audience today? Josh, why don't we start with you? <laughs> um, all right, well, uh, there's gonna be a lot better calls to action. I, I'm gonna tell you that now, because uh, all right, so the call to action that I would just say is to um, um, focus on the long game, but obviously make, make, do what you need to do in the short term, but really focus on the long game and do not get seduced by CARES Act dollars and do not get seduced by um, um, one horizontal, i.e. youth, when we had to focus on the bigger picture too. Um, and then I forgot the second part of the question, so no, no, no worries. Yeah, perfect. okay, good enough. Great. Good job, everybody. <laughs> What's your call to action? Um, lean in. Yeah, just learn more about this work. I, we were able to cover a lot on today's calls, but there's just so many nuances around the digital divide that, you know, I've been working in this space for seven years and I'm still learning things daily. So um, that's my biggest call to action is just uh, take this on as an, an issue. Um, we need more philanthropists that hold this as a core strategy and not something that's wedged into another social strategy. Um, and then, you know, on a particular level, if you're in the Bay Area, I would love to connect. Uh, we're doing a lot of interesting work both in, in Oakland and in partnership with Jordan and his team in San Jose. So you can um, check out our organization more fully at techexchange.org. So thanks for the time today. Sure. Jordan, your call. Thank you. I would say, you know, our immediate needs right now really are the 26,000 device gap uh, for our students. And that will be immensely impactful for us to be able to get across that so that every student has access to distance learning equally. 
Um, second of all is we haven't forgotten about other marginalized populations, battered women, homeless, and elderly. And so we are working also on other projects that we're teeing up uh, to, to accomplish and address those populations as well. So thank you very much and really appreciate y'all. Great, Jenny? Uh, my call to action would be that we really need to see federal funding for this type of initiative. Um, there's been some talk about it, but you know we haven't really seen the type of dollars allocated to it that's necessary really across the country. And it is one of the most important equity issues that we have in our generation today. Um, I would encourage everyone to speak with their legislators and all of your networks in, in order to try to push for more funding because it's just such a large issue that you know, all of the work that we do is obviously critically important in catalyzing uh, change, but there needs to be permanence. And, and so it's really an issue that we need to see some federal action on. Um, you know, and maybe a second call to action would be just to encourage people to continue building the partnerships. Um, it takes time and it's hard to coordinate and collaborate with such large groups, but it's such a large problem that, um, you know, you need a community to really be able to, uh, to, to get, get, a, get a program of this size going. And, um, you know, and, and, and I think that work is really crucial to our benefit in Chicago. So amazing responses from everybody. A huge plus one, Jenny, on legislation. Um, it, it, is, it is a significant issue to be able to have the ability to manage, govern, and regulate the industry in such a way that we're able to do this together for the good of all. Um, so for those philanthropies who are interested in getting involved in that work, I think it's really important to uh, reach out to any of us here on the line. Um, a specific call to action in Los Angeles, other than to just to make sure that people are aware of the scope of this challenge and share that information with your networks and partners and the amazing support of the Michelson Foundation here today. Um, my call to action for LA is we're trying to look at how to make sure this just doesn't become part of our future conversations. So we are starting a vision lab working with local entrepreneurs, particularly in the most affected communities in South LA and Watts, to be able to lift up companies that are going to destroy the digital divide. We don't want to have this conversation three years from now or four years from now. We want companies like Human IT and like SEP to be proliferating all over the country. And so we're going to be working with entrepreneurs who have new ideas about how to make that happen in completely different ways than what we've been able to accomplish so far. So if you're interested in being a partner on the Vision Lab, reach out to me. Um, so I'll send it back over to Miguel and the team. Thank you all for um, participating today. Panelists, feel free to drop your contact information in the chat as well. And thank you all for paying attention. Thank you so much, Jean. And uh, thank you to all our panelists for today's uh, insightful conversation. Uh, this installment of Connecting California was presented by the Michelson 20MM Foundation in service of advancing digital equity for all California students and families. Uh, thanks again to our foundation partners, the California Community Foundation, the Angel Foundation, and Southern California Grantmakers. We'll post the recording of today's discussion on our YouTube uh, channel, the Michelson 20MM Foundation, uh, by tomorrow, uh, and include links in the video description so that you can join our Connecting California LinkedIn group, uh, which, is which is a dedicated space to foster collaboration amongst California's philanthropic community to advance digital equity and close the, the divide faster and together. Uh, you can stay engaged and sign up for our newsletter at 20mm.org. That's the number two, the number zero, M as in Mary, M as in Mary dot O-R-G, uh, to receive news and updates about our next Connecting California event. Uh, if you have any questions or feedback, I'd personally love to hear from you. And you can reach me at uh, miguel at 20mm.org. Thanks again and have a great rest of the day.